going to enter the Word of God, so let's do that with a word of prayer, always. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the Word that you've given us. We thank you for the Word that became incarnate and dwelt among us. We thank you that you've gone to such extremes on our behalf. We do pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit, you would reveal your Word to us and illuminate what you would have of us in response as we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, our coming King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are in chapter 2. We took three sessions to get through chapter 1, and as you understand the content of chapter 1, you can make a career of that one chapter. And I can tell you that I don't anticipate that. I think we'll be able to get through chapter 2 in one session. You can relax on that issue. But last time we talked about the seven bridges of Königsberg as a little tutorial. In the town of Königsberg, there's an island called Kniphof with two branches of the river Pregel flowing around it. There are seven bridges crossing the two branches. And the question that was posed was whether a person can plan a walk in such a way that he will cross each of the bridges once but not more than once. Let's start there on the island. We cross a bridge. Then we cross, come around and cross those two bridges. You have a lot of options, but th this is one way. Then you cross that. Now you're on the little peninsula there, right? Okay. And then you cross that bridge. Uh-oh, we've got a problem here. And here comes the key. Here's the key. Where do you go next? Very simple. Every river has a source. You go around the source and then cross that last bridge and you've crossed each bridge once and only once. Now you say, gee, that's cheating. No, it isn't. There is a profound lesson here, and that's why this is such a classic. This is such a classic. What's the lesson? If you study in mathematics or in science, a field of study called paradox resolution, when you're confronted with what appears to be an insoluble problem, a paradox, an ostensible paradox may be nothing more than the imputation of an assumed constraint which, once removed, quickly uses resolution. You see, the, idea, the lesson here is pretty straightforward. You've got to think outside the box. Often we are victims of our own self-imposed presumptions. The little diagram of the river obviously is incomplete. To solve the problem, you've got to step back enough to recognize that every river has a source. And so you could go around that source to solve the problem. There's a lesson there. That's the reason I take your time to reflect on that, because that is exactly the mindset you need when you confront apparent paradoxes, I call them ostensible paradoxes, in the Scripture. You see, that's what Dr. Einstein did with his special theory of relativity back in 1905. He was wrestling with the, what was called special relativity. Length, mass, velocity are all relative to the observers. But the big breakthrough was 10 years later, 1915, his theory of general relativity, when he realized that in grappling with the problems of three-dimensional space, he realized that the reason there was a problem is because space has more than three dimensions. And he realized that, it's a, that Planck's constant is a four-dimensional constant. And that space and time are inextricably linked. You and I live not in just three dimensions of space. We live in a four-dimensional continuum. Length, width, height, and time. Time is a physical property. And once you understand that, all kinds of theological paradoxes evaporate. And uh, we live in a four-dimensional continuum, and this is no longer a theory. This has been confirmed uh, over a dozen ways to incredible precision. Now, time itself is not uniform. It's a physical property. It varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity, among other things. You and I exist in more than three dimensions. That's the whole point. How many dimensions do we live in? Actually, about ten, apparently. We've just gone beyond Euclid. When we were in school, we learned Euclidean mathematics. That's a mathematics limited to three dimensions. But in 1854, on June 10th, George Riemann gave the most important mathematical lecture of history, where he introduced the concept of metric tensors. And it took 60 years before Einstein applied that mathematics to create the four-dimensional time 
continuum that now we recognize. In 1950, and he, Einstein went to his death because he, it never occurred to him to go one more. He couldn't reconcile light and supergravity. But in 1953, Kaluza and Klein, two other scholars, doing the same thing Einstein did, going up, adding one dimension, suddenly that yielded. And then in 1963, Yang and Mills developed the Yang Mills field, which was thus enabled to embrace electromagnetic and both the nuclear forces, the so-called weak and, and strong nuclear forces. The current thinking among most thinkers and since 1984, the widely held view is that we live in ten dimensions. Four are directly discernible, and six of them are curled in less than 10 to the minus 35 centimeters, smaller than the wavelength of light, and therefore we can only infer them by indirect means. And so, question, is God subject to the restrictions of mass acceleration or gravity? Of course not. So God is not somebody who has lots of time. He's someone outside the time dimension altogether. And uh, that's, that's unique to Him. And we talked previously about this idea of a timeline, that eternity to us is just a line of infinite length from infinity to the left to infinity to the right. Well, that makes good poetry, but it's bad physics. Because we are, in, we are in the, if you take this line and visualize it coming out at you, we're at the present, behind us is the past, and ahead of us is the future. If someone's outside that dimensionality of time altogether, say, dwelling in eternity, then those, are, those can be viewed simultaneously. He can, God alone knows the end from the beginning, and so on. And so... And uh, people like us, Einstein says, who believe in physics know that the distinction between the past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. We need to understand that because as we grapple some of the issues that occurred in chapter 1 and will continue in this epistle, uh, we need the, the strength of that horizon. So last time we went through the first chapter of Ephesians, which the first six verses had to do with the blessings from the Father. He has chosen us, He's adopted us, and He's accepted us. And then the next uh, half a dozen verses, blessings from the Son. He has redeemed us. He's forgiven us. He's revealed God's will to us. And He also has made us an inheritance. Uh, we not only have an inheritance in Him, He has an inheritance in us. Breathtaking. And then the final verses had to do with blessings from the Spirit. He sealed us. He's given us an earnest or down payment to seal the bargain. And then the chapter closed last time with a prayer for understanding. And we're going to have, chapter 3 will have a prayer, the second prayer in, the, in this whole package, for enablement. But the prayer for understanding, back then, that God may give you spiritual understanding, that you might know the hope of His calling, that you might know the riches of His inheritance, and that you might know His power. And that was, that's the wrap-up of chapter 1 that we concluded last time. A rather incredible chapter from many points of view. Do you realize from chapter 4 through chapter 13, 14 was one sentence in the Greek? <laughs> he really loads his sentences. We need to be on the alert for that. And uh, so, so what made chapter 1 so challenging, all these topics, not only the blessings, of course, the concept of election, predestination, redemption, adoption, the will of God itself, the 12 mysteries of God, the dispensations, we introduced that concept, the issue of forgiveness, and the issue of inheritance, and sealing. These are, each one would be justifiably spent for a full hour just to explore what those words really mean. So no wonder chapter 1 was challenging uh, to our intellects in, in, in many ways. But we, one thing that I hoped helped was this paradigm of divine volition, as I call it. Foreknowledge, election, predestination are the core of our struggles there. Foreknowledge determines the election. God knows beforehand what's going to happen. And that, pre, then that uh, pre, predestination then brings to pass what He elected. And uh, election looks back to foreknowledge, and predestination looks forward to destiny. But these are just steps in this paradigm of God's will, the divine volition. And I hope that's useful. But anyway, we're in chapter 2. What's chapter 2 going to look like? Well, we're going to be raised and seated on the throne in the first 10 verses. It's going to deal with what we were, what God did, and wh what we are now is going to be profiled for us in the first 10 verses. Then we're going to talk about that we are reconciled and set into the temple. Really? 
Yeah, he's going to talk about what the Gentiles were. Bear in mind, Ephesians was a Gentile church primarily, so that's going to all come up here. What the Gentiles were, what God did, and what the Gentiles and Jews are now. So this is basic stuff that we're going to hit right into. And uh, this whole prelude here of Ephesians 2 is really a preamble to the astonishing disclosures in chapter 3. In chapter 3, Paul is going to treat us to elements of God's Word that does not appear in the Old Testament that Paul was given the privilege of revealing to his servants, the prophets, the, uh, the whole concept of the church. And most people who have problems in eschatology really have their fundamental problem in ecclesiology, understanding what is the church, what is its origin, what is its destiny, and really what is its mission. It's different than some people presume. Okay, so chapter 1 emphasized our possessions in Christ. Chapter 2 is going to emphasize our position in Christ, and that will surprise you. And your position, of course, determines your possessions and your authority. And by the way, in, in this high plane of letter, realize Paul himself was a prisoner when he wrote it. In fact, he was a prisoner because of his dealing with these truths, interestingly enough. The power that raised Christ from the grave and crowned Him with glory and honor is the same power that now works in our lives, raising us from spiritual death and seating us in the heavenlies. There's a parallel here that's very much intended. We're going to open this chapter with the spiritual corpses in Death Valley. Man's problem is that he is out of harmony with his environment. Does that sound like an ecological thing? Well, it's very true. We are out of harmony with our environment. We're alienated from the life of God. That's our problem. There's an interesting parallel here with Genesis chapter 1. I happen for other reasons to be going through this whole gap theory business in Genesis 1 with the, the uh, International Standard Version people. Genesis chapter 1 it starts out with a scene of desolation, chaos, and ruin. But the earth had become without form and void, the text actually says. Then we have the introduction of divine power, but the Spirit of God brooded on the face of the waters, and God said, let light be. And we have the creation of new life, which then goes on for the rest of that first chapter. It's interesting that in the official Ephesians, the, chapter, the first three verses of chapter 2 is going to present a scene of desolation, chaos, and ruin. And then we're going to have the introduction of God's power in verse 4, and we're going to have the creation of new life from chapter 5 and following. So chapter 2, verse 1, Paul continues, and. Notice that word, and. That's a key word because it connects with what went on before. And you hath he quickened who were dead in depressed and sins. This is a continuation of chapter 1. We're going to be dealing here, by the time we get to verse 3, with the resurrection of power. We were dead. All of us were spiritually dead, lifeless. Why? Due to trespasses and sins. What's a trespass? Violation of known law. What is a sin? Falling short of God's perfection. How many of you here are falling short of God's perfection? I think that's most of us. Yeah, okay. Pretty much. <laughs> What do we mean by death? We mean separation. Physical death is separation of the soul from the body. That seems pretty straightforward. Spiritual death is being alienated from the life of God. Eternally separate. We have no concept of eternal separation. We have no concept of hopelessness. Scary stuff. And that's what's called the second death in Revelation 2 and 20, twice. See, the unbeliever is not sick. The unbeliever's dead. That's hard to grasp. Feels alive. No, he's dead. And he does not need resuscitation. He needs resurrection. And that's what we're dealing with here. And uh, continuing, where in time past ye walked according, he's speaking to these Gentile readers, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. 
Who is the prince of the power of the air? Whose title is that? Satan's. And I do think there's a pun involved here. The term here is much broader than I'm about to apply, but I think it's also the power of the air, of the TV, of the radio, of the media. We're in an election cycle right now. In a democracy, the role of the media is to inform the electorate, the people voting. And what's astonishing is to see the deceit and managing of expressions to almost force the people's vote in a direction that's contrary to their own interests. A media that universally, while it appears that there's four or five mainline channels, wait a minute, it's clear that there is a conspiracy to somehow shape opinions rather than inform them. What's astonishing are the truths that are being withheld from the public by that media. And it's one of the most... uh, clearest examples as to who they really belong to. Say, well, you're a conspiracy theorist. Only in the sense that there's an ultimate conspirator is Satan himself. The prince of the power of the air. Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Power of the air we're dealing with here. This flagrant disregard for truth in our public media demonstrates for those of us that are paying attention who is really behind it all. Almost every doctrine that the Bible espouses is the doctrine being attacked by one of the political parties that controls the media. Interesting. Depraved, be meandered according to the weather vein of this world, the path of deceit, immorality, ungodliness, selfishness, violence, and rebellion. That describes our entertainment media. It describes where we're all as a culture, really at. It's diabolical, the prince of the power of the air. It's interesting that the birds fly through the air, but the birds, idiomatically speaking, in Luke chapter 8, verse 5, and Matthew 13, were what? The ministers of Satan flying through the air. Interesting. And disobedient, walking according to the Spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience. So there is a, we are in a spiritual war. Continuing, among whom also we all had our conversation or behaviors, perhaps. The word conversation is no longer used the way it was used back in the 1611. The word conversation, we use it in a more restricted sense. Back then it was a broader term referring to our general behavior. Among whom we all, also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Notice the we there. Paul is putting himself in that category too. We, all of us. We're carnal. And the conversation time passed, our lust, desires of flesh were self-centered. What do you mean by lust? Any desires that are against the will of God. And what do you mean by corrupt? Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, abandoning to every natural desire, of thought as well as act. Through the marvelous gift of imagination, we throw the reins on the neck of the steeds of passion. I like that phrase. Pretty, very descriptive. And, uh, and as a result, condemned. Children of wrath appointed unto wrath and to judgment. That's what we mean by that. These few clauses here sum up sin and its consequences as well as can be spread out in the first three chapters of the book of Romans. You want the textbook on sin and its remedy, uh, book of Romans. Man has three enemies, according to 1 John 2. The world, the devil, and the flesh. They're each distinctive. Each threat is distinctive. The world has its grasp and threat on each of us. The devil has his strategy and agenda attacking each of us. But the day will come when those two are dealt with and we still blow it. For a thousand years, Satan's going to be bound. We'll be without excuse. The flesh is sufficient to condemn us. What do we mean by the flesh? Old English term for the fallen nature. 
I like the way it's... But one is not a horse thief because he steals a horse. He steals a horse because he's a horse thief. <laughs> it's our nature. But God... Boy, that's a strong term right there. Those are precious words. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us... See, but God, This is the most significant, eloquent, and inspiring transitions in literature... There's no more dramatic transition than an adversity of conjunction, but God. The author is God Himself. No one else could have done it. No one else would have done it. There's two aspects there. What's the source of His mercy? His love. It's greater to be loved by the mighty sovereign of the universe than by any fellow human being. That's the most precious love you can claim. You can claim God's love. Deals with everything. For His great love. How great is He? How great was His love? How would you dramatize His love? Well, that's easy. Examine the price that was paid. It's going to serve as a model for the entire universe throughout eternity. It's going to show up in verse 7, a, a widely overlooked verse in this series. Of course, it was a, it, it, the, well, you and I have a love letter that was written in blood on a wooden cross to, erected in Judea 2,000 years ago. It was at Calvary that God displayed His hatred for sin and His love for us as sinners. We get that backwards. We hate the sinner and love the sin. God it was the other way around. He hates sin. You want to know how spiritually mature you are? How much do you hate sin? When you hate sin the way God does it, then you're growing. God's hatred for sin is love for us is the key parameter here. Even when we we're dead in sins. He hath quickened us together with Christ. We were dead. So we want to compare our unworthiness, unloveliness there. We were dead through trespasses. We were enemies of God. Yes, we were. Destitute and degraded. That describes us. He could love us without being able to save us. But fortunately, John 3.16 comes to our rescue there. It was in His grace that He saves us. You can't keep Him from loving you. But you can turn your back on Him and refuse His redemption. You can't keep the sun from shining, but you can get out of the sunshine. He was our representative, not only for us, but as us. When He died, we died. When He died on that cross, he, we died, if we'll accept that. When He was buried... We were buried. That's the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, first four verses. That he, Christ, he died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. All these fulfilling the specifications that were laid down before the foundation of the world. When He was buried, we were buried. And as a result, we are quickened with Christ, raised up with Him, and seated in Him. That's where we are. That's our position. Astonishing though that may be. In the Gospels, there were three people raised by Jesus. The widow's son in Luke 7, Jairus' daughter in Luke 8, and Lazarus in John 11. Each of these was raised up by the spoken word that gave life. See, and like, we're like Lazarus, and it's very instructive to study Lazarus, because we're in the same shoes. Lazarus was dead. His relative says, told him not to interfere. He stinks already. It was four days, deliberately for four days. He was dead. Then he was called forth. And he struggles forward in his grave clothes. He's no longer dead. He has been raised, but he is tied up in his grave clothes, struggling. He can't do anything. He's still got the grave clothes wrapped around him. That's where many of us are. We're no longer dead, but we're still defeated. We haven't gotten rid of our grave clothes. And that's what chapter 4 in Ephesians is going to deal with a few sessions from now. It took Moses 40 years to shed his grave clothes. It took Joseph 13 years in prison to shed his. And David, his whole escapades from Saul. Even Paul took him three years in Arabia, apparently. 
After he was dead, after he was no longer defeated, he was dangerous. You get into John 12, and the Pharisees are plotting the death of Lazarus. Couldn't have this guy continue to walk around. He was threatening their strongholds. That's where we should be. Not dead, not defeated, but dangerous to Satan's kingdom. Continuing, he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And um, you remember that places doesn't appear there. That's just, that's introduced by the translators. In the heavenlies. Our position, we're already raised, we're already delivered, we're no longer earthbound, we're no longer occupied with the trivial and the transient. That's where we should be. And you may recall the whole synopsis of all history in Matthew 20, the last few verses of Matthew 23. The purpose of all history, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers chickens. The tragedy of all history, but ye would not, speaking of Israel. But the triumph was that they, they will. That in, you know, here's, the, here's the verse 7. People say, gee, Chuck, why, why did God bother? He, before the foundation of the world, he knew that Adam would sin. He knew that there'd be all this disaster from sin. Why did he bother? Good question. The answer, everybody memorizes Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. They're coming. Everybody misses this verse, verse 7, which answers the why. That in ages to come, He, God, might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. This whole thing is a cosmic drama for ages yet to come, yet undisclosed. That in ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace. How? In His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, the gift of His Son. That in ages to come, And by the way, in this chapter that we've started, these first seven verses are another one of Paul's single sentences in the Greek. From verse 1 to 7 is a single periodic sentence in the Greek. Why did Adam fall so with? Why this laborious, painful, crimson thread from Eden to Golgotha? Well, here's here's the question. How does one demonstrate infinite power, infinite knowledge? Well, you could argue the creation does that for us. Well, how does one demonstrate infinite love? Ah, that's a tougher thing to demonstrate. By the redemption. The redemption, the extremes that God has gone to on our behalf is the way He's demonstrating the limitless love of our Creator. It's a cosmic demonstration. This is the secret behind the drama. That in ages yet to come, he might demonstrate his kindness, his kindness toward us, his grace in his kindness toward us, the riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. In fact, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. See how, you see how Paul builds his sentences? He adds boxcar after boxcar after boxcar on this thing. So we are, tested, we are to testify to His glory just as His faithfulness to Israel back in, we, in Ezekiel 36 and so on. For, now we get to this famous verse that we've all, I assume, memorized. For by grace are ye saved, through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. That, that not of yourselves. It is, it's a gift. You didn't earn it. These next three verses are the clearest statement of the plan of salvation in the Bible. You'll find it also in Romans 3 and Philippians 3. It originates with the grace of God, His initiative. It wasn't your initiative that found God. It was His initiative. And it's given as a present possession. It's something you own right now. You don't have to wait till eternity. You have it right now. And the way is through faith. The commitment of a person to the person. And it can't be earned. Many people try. They create rules and regulations and laws. No, 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 no. There may be things you can, inheritance that you can qualify for, but that's not, we're we're talking about here, salvation can't be earned. It is a gift. And you insult the giver by imposing any additional conditions. Not of works, lest any man should boast. That's verse 9, how precious. Not of works. It's astonishing how we uh, seem to want to avoid that declaration. It cannot be earned. It's not of works. It's not earned by confirmation if you're a Lutheran. It's not earned by baptism. 
It's not earned by church membership or church attendance or tithing or Holy Communion or trying to keep the Ten Commandments or living by the Sermon on the Mount. Not that these things are bad, but you can't earn your salvation if, even if you should succeed at these things by being a good neighbor, by living a moral, respectable life. No, these are all works. If they're in their highest uh, appellations, they're still just works, and that's not, that does not save you. Jesus Christ saved you in 100% by His effort, not yours. Not of works. Man is not re- saved by works. He is not saved by faith plus works. Man is saved by faith alone. And that was the, the banner of the Reformation, clinging to that insight. He, Jesus, did it all. Any attempt to add to his completed work is blasphemy. It's a denial of Christ's commitment. Why? Lest any man should boast. It is a finished work. We saw that again and again and again. It is finished, he declared from the cross. You and I can't add anything to what he has completed on our behalf. Salvation is a gift, not a reward. There are rewards, but salvation is is a prelude to even qualifying for rewards. And why is this thing? Very simple. To preclude preclude any human boasting. The only man-made things in heaven will be scars on our Redeemer. If a man could be served by works, he could be saved by works, then his prayer in Gethsemane was unanswered. Three times he desperately prayed, if there's any other way, let's take it. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done, he said. If man could be saved by works, then the death of Christ was unnecessary. Whew, think about that one. And a man would be his own savior. And if you're your own savior, that's a form of idolatry. That's forbidden. If a man's his own savior, God's glory is not going to be shared. God will not be your debtor. And then we have this beautiful verse 10, 8, 9, 10. For we are his workmanship. Oh, I love that word. His workmanship. In the Greek, it's poema. Poema. Same word that we get the word poem from. For we are his poem, huh? Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. See, we're created in Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Workmanship. Boy, this is the only place that this appears in the New Testament. And uh, and also Romans one twenty. Use of God's creation. The handiwork of God, not of ourselves. His masterpiece. And our conversation, our behavior is not the end. It is just the beginning. It's the beginning. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. See, works are the fruit, not the root. Works are the consequence, not the antecedent of our acceptance in Christ. We're not accepted in Christ because our works, our works derive from the fact that we are accepted in Christ. We work because we are saved, not in order to earn it. Works demonstrate the reality of our faith. What kind of works are we talking about? To find His will for us and to obey it. That sounds pretty glib. How do you do that? To confess and forsake sin as soon as we are conscious of it. Step one, always. Then to be continually and unconditionally yielded to Him. Study the Word of God to discern His will and then to do whatever it is He tells you to do. And you should spend time in prayer every day. We all promise to. We're not as faithful as we should be. We should work on that, all of us. And we should respond to opportunities for service as He leads. As He leads. You should cultivate fellowship and the counsel of other Christians. And why do you do all this? To glorify God. And that's all through the Scriptures. We don't have to beat that to death. Let's go ahead. See, for the previous ten verses, Paul discussed salvation in general. But now, he's going to focus on the work of Christ for the Gentile in particular. 
because that's his primary mission, primary ministry is to the Gentiles. So we're going to shift gears here from the broad brush down to getting very specific. Verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. In other words, uncircumcision is the label that the Jew would put on the Gentile. And remember that we were, he's saying, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles of the flesh. See, we were despised. See, uncircumcision was a term of reproach. And it was intended to be in contrast to Israel's opportunity because they were God's chosen, God's called. The word circumcision is to connote that they were chosen, set apart, not merely physical. It was an outward sign of what's supposed to have been an inward reality. But, of course, it was no proof of real faith. It, uh, and the circumcision we're dealing with, in fact, is of the heart. That's a term used in Romans 2 and Philippians 3 and Colossians 2. Circumcision is of the heart. The outward sign has uh, served a different purpose. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles of the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. See, the Jews enjoyed a great privilege before God. But that, unfortunately, and that's all dealt with in Romans 9, by the way, pride and arrogance is what it led to. The greatest racial and religious difference the world has ever known is between the Jew and the uncircumcised Gentile. And Paul, of course, he's the speaker here, the writer here, is a Pharisee, the most exclusive club within that uh, category. The Gentile it was a foreigner. Remember Rahab and Ruth? They were both foreigners. They're both saved, but they were foreigners. Rahab was an Amorite. Ruth was a Moabitess. And it was forbidden by law to bury a Moabitess, but Boaz does anyway. Why? Well, because Rahab was his mother, but that's a whole other part of the story. Okay. The Sidonian woman, Mark 7, was also a Gentile. It's interesting that since Noah, no covenants were ever made with Gentiles. You and I benefit from a covenant, the covenant of Abraham, because we're grafted in by faith. So our all our benefits derive from the Abrahamic covenant. Continuing in verse 12, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That's hard for us to accept. But we need to understand that. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Aliens regarding man's separation from God. The Messiah was promised to the nation Israel. The blessings, yet, nevertheless, the blessings were promised to Gentiles. In many places in the Old Testament, Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 60 being examples. Well, gee, that's, wait a minute. I thought I said the church was something not revealed in the Old Testament. That's right. What do you mean by the church? Not just that Gentiles could be saved. Gentiles could be saved by being a proselyte back then. So that isn't the distinctive. We're going to get to the distinctive, and it'll surprise you. But as Gentiles, we were without God in the world. And that does not mean they were atheists. They were godless in their conduct. They had no real knowledge of the living God. And by the way, this refutes any notion that the pagan relations are just as acceptable to God. Absolutely not. Paul cites the Ephesians as Christ, their Christ-like stake as a definite tragedy. Outside Christ is a condemnation. You might note Psalm 115 and review it sometime. Without God in the world. See, the Gentiles knew the true God, but deliberately refused to honor Him, according to Romans 1. In fact, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are a saga of devolution, not evolution, a descent, not an ascent of man. We always see these little diagrams of National Geographic or Scientific American, whatever, showing the ascent of man. Very colorful, but just the opposite of truth. The true history of man is a descent, not an ascent. 
The first 11 chapters are of that saga. But in chapter 12, it all changes because Abraham is called by God. The Jews are separated so the Gentiles might also be saved because the salvation of the Gentiles would come about by God's program of the Messiah through Israel. It's that Messiah that's the benefit of all of us. So here's our summary of our predicament in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 12. We're without Christ. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Boy, that's a pretty sad state of affairs. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. But now, another one of these wonderful reversals. What a reprieve. But now, and this, this parallels the ver- first four that we talked about earlier. Paul's going to describe a new class that is neither Jew nor Gentile. So d- don't get caught by surprise here. This whole thing is a prelude to the discovery that's going to be announced in the next chapter. Chapter 3. We, we, we were far off. And so this verse it summarized the Gent- it, 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 it summarizes the Gentiles' condition in two words: far off, far off from Israel, far off from God. While the problem of sinners in general was spiritual death, the problem of the Gentiles in particular was spiritual distance from God and His blessings. And note in the Gospels that whenever Christ helped a Gentile, He did it at a distance. Ooh, that's interesting. Matthew 8, Matthew 15 being examples. We were afar off. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, middle wall of partition may not mean a lot to us if you're not familiar with history and the Jewish situation there. Our peace in Christ was foretold, by the way. In Isaiah 9, we celebrate every Christmas. Uh, Isaiah 53, of course, and a lot of other places. But the scope of his work, Christ's work, he unites the Jew and the Gentile, and that was predicted in Mark 5, and Micah 5, 5. And the demolition of this wall of partition that Paul is alluding to here is important for us to understand. Do you realize that access to the temple when it was in operation was forbidden on the pain of death? If you and I, you or I in those days would have found a way to get into that temple, they would kill us. It was a capital crime as far as they were concerned. The wall of partition. Josephus records this, and in 1871 we actually discovered a sign that was operative back in the in this temple period. It said, let no one of any other nation come within the fence and barrier around the holy place. Whosoever will be taken doing so will himself be responsible for the fact that his death will ensue. Wow. They, they took it seriously. In fact, our writer of this epistle was arrested and condemned by the Jews in Jerusalem on the basis of a false accusation they took in Ephesian, Trophimus, uh, beyond this barrier. It was a false accusation but it was that accusation that caused him to be arrested. That's all in Acts 21 for those who want to check it out. So Paul was arrested and condemned for an apparent violation of this very issue that he's dealing with here. Continuing, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. What did he abolish? The law of commandments contained in the ordinances. There are Gentiles today that are trying to put themselves under the law. They don't understand the book of Galatians, among other things. What is equally, and perhaps even more confusing to the Jew, is there are Jews that are still trying to do that. Law of commandments contained in the ordinances. Some religious groups, I'll leave them undetermined, still attempt to get Christians back under the law. You know, as Christians, we often uh, discover the richness of the Jewish festivals, and there's a lot to learn, and it's worth doing. But as we get into 
fellowshipping with some of the Messianic groups, you'll quickly get on the the mailing list of these publishers, the Fruits of Vine and others, they will send you all kind of literature explaining how even though you're a Christian, you're supposed to be keeping the Torah and, and get under the law. And they still try to get people to do that. But the re- re- your remedy to that is the book of Galatians and Colossians. Both of them deal with that. To make himself of twain one new man. We will talk about the inner man of each of us, but that's really not what's in view here. It may surprise you. This is not referring to the individual believer as such, but it's an idiom for the church as the body of Christ in the sense of 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 1, Colossians 3, and also Hebrews 12. That the church is an entity called the body of Christ. It's a unity. It's an entity. That's that's the term. That's what he's really referring to here. The scope is worked. You unite Jew and Gentile. That was predicted in Micah 5. It demolishes this wall of partition, if you will. That's the way Paul describes it. It's also the abolition of the enmity that raged. Jew and Gentile was one of the rages. And the the enmity between man and God. They're different, but they both have been abolished. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, having slain the enmity thereby, the law, the cause of man's enmity. Christ removed the law as the cause by dying to pay the penalty of the law that had been broken. Christ paid the penalty. It's done deal. That's what justification means. That's what the book of Romans uh, is all about. The law has nothing more to say to those who are in Christ because he paid for that on the cross. The penalty has been paid in full. To imply that you have any liability there is to deny the, is to embrace double jeopardy. Jesus said, "Paid in full. It is finished." Under, need to understand the, the the finality of all of that. We are not under the law, but under grace. We are not to live as we please, but we are to live as He pleases. These are astonishing changes. You see, it's new that the Gentile has equal rights and privileges with the Jew. That's, a, that's hard for them, even the enlightened ones, to really absorb. Both Jew and Gentile lose their national identities by becoming Christians. Jews and Gentiles are fellow members of the body of Christ. It's a unity. We need to understand that. It's hard. The Gentiles have their difficulties understanding that. The Jews have their difficulties understanding that. A Jew has the hope of reigning with Christ instead of being a subject in his kingdom. Not that that's bad. Don't misunderstand me. But he has a higher uh, inheritance. A Jew himself is no longer under the law. You think you and I have trouble understanding that we're not under the law. Can you imagine the difficulties of a Jew embracing that? And that's what the epistle of the Hebrews focuses on because those readers were Jews while the temple was still in operation, warning them to uh, get out of that or they'd die. And the ones that stayed around did die. The others flew to Pella and were, went on. And came and preached peace unto you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. Afar off and nigh. The Gentiles were far off, the Jews were near. You which were far off, that's the Gentile readers. And then that were nigh, those that were near. See, Christ is our peace. Christ made peace. Christ came and preached peace. These are all in the last four verses. He preached peace in the resurrection in Luke 24. Among his first words after his resurrection, John 20 and 21, through the Holy Spirit in Acts 10. One spirit. Now, I want you to notice the repeat again and again the unifying, the one, to emphasize the unifying work of Christ. The proof of that peace is access at any time into the presence of God. In contrast to the access of the high priest who only on Yom Kippur could enter the Holy of Holies, only on that day and only after great ceremonial preparations. 
That was a big deal, having access. You and I have access anytime, directly, ourselves. Through prayer, you can enter the throne room of the universe. You can kneel down before the sovereign of the universe, and you can address him as Father. Wow. We need to understand what that means. By the way, did you notice the Trinity again? I'm going to highlight this all through this epistle. Through Him, that's the Son, one Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, we have access unto the Father. The Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Father in that one verse. The Trinity. You're going to see the, tr- the stamp of the Trinity all through this epistle. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in and of the household of God. Fellow citizens. Means you've got new privileges. We're no longer dogs, a term they use for Gentiles, aliens, outsiders, strangers. No, we're first class citizens. The Jews have no advantage over us. That's hard for them to swallow, but that's what Paul is instructing us here. Contrast the old position of the Gentiles with their new position in Christ. In the new creation, every believer has the privilege of coming into the Holy of Holies. That's what Hebrews 10 hammers home. Let's take a look at our old position versus the new position. The old position was summarized in chapter, I mean, verse 12, if you recall. And verses 13 and 19 describe a new position. The old, old position, we were without Christ. Now we are in Christ. The old position, we were aliens. Now we're a holy nation. First Peter, that's Peter's term. We used to be strangers. Now we're no more strangers, Paul tells us here. We had no hope in the old position. We are called in one hope. In Ephesians 4, we're going to amplify all that. Old position, we were without God. And in the in our new position, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're in His household. We're not in the throne room. We are in the family room. And you can also compare all of this with Peter's comparison in his own presentation before the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15. And all nations, by the way, are now eligible through all of this. There are three families under Noah. He had three sons, remember? All three families are highlighted in the book of Acts. The Ethiopian treasure in Acts 8 represents the Hamites. Saul of Tarsus himself, becoming Paul, was a Shemite, of course. And, of course, Cornelius the Roman was from Japheth, Acts 10. So they all are highlighted there. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone Wow, we're going to get into a huge misunderstanding that's been promoted here about who, what stone and rock are we talking about. Are built upon the foundation of the apostles. The temple has a foundation, a cornerstone, a cohesive agent. It speaks to unity, symmetry, growth, and so forth. And this was an appropriate term, obviously for the Jews who think of the temple, but also for the Gentiles in Ephesus because it was the temple of Diana of Ephesians. It was an incredible the concept of a temple as a center point was familiar to them. But the foundation here is a New Testament foundation, not Old Testament. Christ is the only foundation, is the point he's going to make here. It's interesting that the apostles are associated with the twelve foundations of New Jerusalem. Again, we're dealing with the undergirding here. But Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And that's quoted from Psalm 118. It's so quoted in Mark 12, and you find the same idiom used in Isaiah 8, Acts 4, all through the Scripture, as our chief cornerstone. What does a cornerstone do? It joins walls together. Here, it's referring to the Jews and Gentiles into one church. And it's the keystone of the arch, too. It's the highest place, the preeminent support. Remove it, and the rest collapses is the concept of the cornerstone. Also, the word rock is consistently used throughout the Scripture the same way. And uh, the stone cut without hands was a prominent feature in Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 2. It's interesting, the rock, the stone, the cornerstone, these terms uh, uh, are examples of what some scholars call the principle of expositional constancy. What they mean by that is the Holy Spirit uses idioms consistently, whether it's the Torah, whether it's the prophets of the Old Testament, the Tanakh, or whether it's the New Testament, 
the Gospels or Epistles. The Holy Spirit has a tendency to, to maintain consistency among these idioms. So the term stone, rock, whatever, is, uh, is uh, amazing how, it, uh, how useful it is to recognize that consistency. We are just plunged into the field of ecclesiology. Paul's theme here in this whole epistle is Christ and the church and the eternal plan of God to gather all things in Christ Jesus. That's what the church is all about. The letter began with eternity past and is now carrying us into eternity future. In every sense, Ephesians, this letter, is Paul's greatest word on the church, teaching us what the church is in the mind of God and what it ought to be in the practice of our own uh, selves. Eschatology is a term used for the study of last things. And as you study eschatology, you discover your first dividing point is amillennial, premillennial. And uh, there, are, there used to be some called postmillennial, but they, they really have disappeared from the landscape. There are preterists arising, to try to, which is a variation of the amillennial position. And uh, there used to be uh, uh, reconstructionists and so forth. But the point is, most of us that have a high hermeneutic, think the Bible seriously, tend to be premillennial. And even in, within that category, there's divisions as to does the church or does it not go through the tribulation, and that divides into three groups. But the point I'm making here is most denominations, most Christians that come from a denominational background from, that has its roots in the Reformation, tend to be amillennial. They don't take the millennium seriously. They have no grasp of the uh, covenant of David. Uh, the millennium is a fulfillment of the covenant of David. And they also tend to be post-tribulational. They think the church is are going to go through all these dark times. If you have a high view of, of eschatology, or of a, a, high, a high view of, the, of interpretation of the Bible, a high hermeneutic, you tend to be on the right side of this diagram. You're premillennial and pre-trib. So they're fundamentalists. The other denominations are there pretty much so. This, so if your hermeneutics allow leaning on allegories for doctrine, you swing to the left. If you take the Bible very literally, you swing to the right. So that's a, that's a classical thing. So this leads to a very interesting perspective. Your hermeneutics, your theory of interpretation, determine your eschatology. Your theory, your views of the end times will derive from how seriously, how literally do you take the Scripture. And that gives you the little chart that we just looked at. What's interesting, though, is your eschatology will determine how you view the church. Your concept of ecclesiology will derive from your eschatological view. And uh, that's what we have as we get into the seven churches. We, uh, the eschatology of that will lead to an understanding of what do we really mean by the church. Well, the surprising thing here is this loop closes because your ecclesiology will determine your humanitics. Because your versions of the Bible, how, which, how you use the various versions will impact your hermeneutics. And so you're closing the loop, if you will, on the epistem- epistemology is study of uh, knowledge, its scope and limits. And uh, so that might be useful to you. I suggest it as a possibility. And we'll go ahead and move on. In any case, Christ is the center of all these things. And that's, that's to be paramount. No other foundation, no, for other foundations, again, no man lay than that is laid, which is, Je- is Christ Jesus. And Peter again uses this cornerstone phrase in 1 Peter 2 6, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. It's interesting to understand who's writing this letter. It's a guy by the name of Peter. Peter was the guy at Caesarea Philippi when he gave his declaration. Whom, whom say ye that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was his finest moment. And Christ says, you, you, and did a pun on his name, Petros, Petra, on this rock I shall build my church. Not on Peter, on his commitment that he's the Christ. The Catholic Church and other groups too have said that they, they tried to make, that they, they misunderstand that and, and think that Jesus was saying Peter is the foundation. No, 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 Christ is the foundation. Here is Peter himself clarifying that. I think Peter would be shocked if he heard the kinds of things that are being said, that he somehow is the first pope and all that nonsense. 
This letter was written by the one who was at Christ, with him at Caesarea Philippi when Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, on his declaration there. Peter himself clarifies uh, this widely held misunderstanding. He says, because he continues the next two verses, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Who is the head of the corner, the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense? Who is that? Jesus, not Peter. Even them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were uh, appointed, anointed. See, Christ himself is the rock on which the church is built. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. That's the source of the church's life and growth. It's unity, it's symmetry. Stones excavated from the valley of death all fitted together. That's us. You and I have been excavated from the valley of death and fitted together. See, the church is a living organism as it grows. It's interesting to me that the pearl of great price appears in Matthew 13 as an idiom here, and that pearl was not a Jewish ornament because it was non-kosher. But the pearl is a jewel that grows by an irritation. It grows by accretion. And it's removed from its area of growth to become an item of adornment. A very, very interesting idiom to use of the church. Holy temple in the Lord. The word there in verse 21 for holy temple is not hieron, which is the usual word for temple, precincts and so on. It's the word naos, which is the inner shrine, the meeting place between God and His people. That's the word naos that's used there. In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And again, this is a contrast with the Old Testament. Gentiles could not even get near to the habitation of God in the Old Testament. Now they form the habitation of God. Who? And again, note the Trinity here. The habitation of God, that's the Father, in whom the Son, in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Again, we have the, the, again, we have the, uh, the uh, Trinity. So we have God's dwelling place. He dwelt in the Jewish tabernacle in Exodus. He dwelt in Solomon's temple in Second Chronicles 7. He is in the temple of Christ's body in John 1 and 2 and so on. And today, he's in the individual believer, 1 Corinthians 6 and elsewhere. And he's in the church, according to Ephesians 2, that we've just been reading. Seven times in the New Testament, the Scripture says, Ye are the temple of God. And that leads to a whole other study. I won't get into detail, but a highlight for those of you who want to dig into it. Your personal architecture, because that's declared seven times, you are the temple of God. That can be used in just a broad sense that God indwells you. There may be more to it than that. I believe it holds the key to our architecture, our software architecture. We use the term heart, soul, spirit, and mind. What do we mean? If you examine that, you'll discover a lot of confusion on those terms. If you take the temple, you're the temple. The temple, of course, had the Holy of Holies, the holy place, the porch, and the inner court, and the outer court. And that was the architecture of the temple. I believe ye are the temple of God, because the body is the outer court, the soul is the inner court, the heart is the holy place, and the spirit in the Holy of Holies. And around that in the temple were the wooden chambers. Uh, oh, also in the porch, you have the, 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 the exercise of the volition. The choices are made there on the, in, in what was called the porch. And we have the subconscious represented in these hidden chambers. That's where the priests hid their personal items. And they needed to be cleaned out and dealt with properly. So those are all subjects that we deal with in our briefing called the architecture of man. My wife has taken that into a whole series of practical helps, the way of agape and its derivative publications. But... Ephesians 2, we are raised and seated on the throne, the first ten verses, what we were, what God did, and where we are now. We are reconciled and set into the temple, which describes what the Gentiles were, what God did, and what the Gentiles and Jews are now. And all of this is a preamble to chapter 3 for next time. But before you go, think about your grave clothes. Are you you alive in Christ, but still trampled with grave clothes? Are you still bound by the habits of your former life in the graveyard of sin. We all have the grave clothes. Or are you raised and seated on the throne? Do you practice your position in Christ? 
He has worked for you. Now let him work in you and through you that he might lead you in your own grand adventure to the glory of God. So in our next session, it's going to turn out that Paul's unique, it was his unique privilege to reveal a mystery hidden until now. And the mystery is not that the Gentiles could be saved. There's something deeper that, re- that we're going to deal with. I want you, if you get a chance, review your introductory notes to Acts and as also the notes for uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11. Be good background for next time. And then, of course, study carefully chapter 3. And notice, if you will, the cosmological insight in the ver- verse 18 of chapter 3. An astonishing thing that's missed by most people, but a, a startling revelation that will show up there cosmologically. But there's also an epistemological insight that I think you'll see as we go through this, and that's this thing of hermeneutics determining your eschatology, which in turn determines your ecclesiology, which impacts your hermeneutics. We'll explore that a little more thoroughly next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Bar our hearts. Father, we praise you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for this gift that you've given us. Not just the epistle of Ephesians, but this love letter that you wrote to us, written in blood on a wooden cross that was indeed erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. We thank you that that work is finished, that you have arranged for a full payment for our sins and our inadequacies. And we thank you, Father, for this incredible gift that you've provided to us. We pray, Father, you'd help us apprehend it, understand it, embrace it. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit and through your Word, you would illuminate precisely what it is you'd have of each of us in response as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our coming King. Amen.